Ladies and gentlemen, the Gorilla Girls are an art activist group devoted to protesting the underrepresentation of female artists in many of the world's most prominent art museums. They fight for gender and racial equality in the arts by exposing and questioning the status quo. Through a mixture of comedy, facts, and shock, they design and put up posters for the sake of art activism and their mission of redefining the F word, feminism. This exhibition uh, featured at the Benton Museum is a collection of works from the museum's newly acquired Gorilla Girls portfolio, Complete, 1985 to 2012, and seeks to shed light on the group's revolutionary and evolving tactics that have allowed them to combat racism and sexism in the arts and to positively affect art history. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce to you Frida Kahlo of the Gorilla Girls. Hello, Frida. Hi, everyone. Hi. It's, uh, wow, I'm so glad we got a chance to talk. <laughs> this yeah, is, this is great. It's amazing that you've spent three decades working on this, and what, do you think you've seen significant progress? Well, yeah, uh, yes and no. Um, for sure, um, no one could ever say again that women, artists of color, trans artists, marginalized groups, everyone who's not a white male, um, no one would ever say that the art that they make is not part of the art world dialogue. And that's the kind of response we got back in the 80s when we started. Now, that being said, um, other issues have come up, like tokenism, the idea that an institution will show one woman artist, one artist of color, one trans artist, um, and think that they've taken care of the whole problem of diversity. That, you know, that is really an extension of the problem rather than a solution of the problem. Then there's the glass ceiling beyond which marginalized groups rarely go. And then that, of course, leads to um, incoming quality, which is sort of the scourge of the world right now. Um, you know, white men get most, almost all of the money in the art world. Um, I apologize. That's not yeah, I'm not saying all white men, but, you know, the few who have been anointed. Right. And, uh, you know, the rest um, really don't get the same means of production to stay competitive or to produce uh, at the same level. <clears throat> so, yes, things have gotten better, but other things have, you know, have come up in the meantime. I like how you started off by kind of explaining some of the basics of, of what goes into what, what you're doing, the awareness you're trying to bring. And it's important to get the word out. I think a lot of people don't understand what all the basics are about tokenism well, and the glass ceiling. Yeah, our feeling is that <clears throat> if what you see in a museum uh, or in an art history book doesn't look like our culture, it's not really telling the story of our culture. It's telling the story of people who control the culture. Um, and very... there was a time when, you know, the issue of quality was always used to dismiss that, saying, oh, they're just not making work good enough. Well, we know now that history is a much richer story and that uh, unless you tell the whole story, you're just telling part of it. We've been getting a very narrow piece of the pie, I think. We're missing out on so much great stuff out there that nobody gets a chance to see because we're only presented with the same stuff over and over again, same kind of stuff, no diversity, and so opening that up to diversifying the artists that are showcased, that'll help improve, I believe, right? Sure. Um, however, in this sort of era of, you know, late hyper-capitalism, you know, art has become an investment, you know, asset class. And the art market is a very small market that can be easily manipulated. Um, and the more you manufacture the idea of a few masterpieces and a few geniuses, uh, the more you can manipulate the value of a limited quantity of, you know, of precious um, commodities. And that's sort of what's happening um, in the art world. And often big museums are actually controlled by trustees who are also art collectors or art dealers uh, who are involved in art as investment. And we think that that's, um, first of all, it doesn't, it, you know, it, it doesn't present uh, a proper idea of what art is. And also it's kind of a, 
conflict of interest. So <clears throat> we really think the art world is diverse. There are many art worlds, and that um, you know museums should look past the art market and um, have other criteria for showing work that they think is significant rather than just art that costs the, mo- the most. So it's, it's probably not a really democratic way of deciding what art is featured in museums. It's usually a select few of people with power and influence who make those decisions? Well, you know, curators are a class stuck in the middle, museum directors stuck in the middle. They've got to appeal to, you know, to um, people with with big pockets, you know, deep pockets to fund their institutions because we don't have any um, any democratic funding or any, pu- you know, much public funding. Most museums in the United States are actually private, uh, even though they're nonprofit. So um, curators and museum directors, they're in a tough position, you know, to redefine it, but, you know, it is their job. And, you know, the present, you know, is an argument, <laughs> mm. you know, about the past. And um, we think that there should be a larger dialogue uh, about you know, the significance of art uh, beyond, you know, what costs the most. And, you know, there are a lot of billionaire art collectors who are just um, trading art back and forth between each other, seeing the prices go up. Um, And they all have the same collection. And if you look at their collections, you know, it's a small group of, you know, of white males, and they all kind of tell similar stories. And we really think that, you know, art is, first of all, global, international, um, and, you know, there's so much intercommunication in the world that if, you know, if an art collection doesn't look like the world or, you know, isn't diverse, it really is very limited. Hmm. And now you're not focusing just on, say, pieces of art that are displayed in a museum on a pedestal or hanging on a wall. You're, you're also bringing a focus to film, right? And I want to talk about um, your experience with Pharrell. You were, telling, no. <laughs> you were telling me earlier about how you were asked to be in an exhibit that he was overseeing or in Paris. Yeah, well, you know, after he and Robin Thicke got, you know, into some deep water uh, over their um, video, Blurred Lines, mm-hmm. um, I remember that. Pharrell decided that he wanted to curate a show about femininity, uh, whatever, you know, femininity means, which is kind of a, a word that is so culturally constructed, I'm not sure what that means. But what he, what it meant to him is women. Yeah. So, you so, know, we really don't show very often in those kinds of shows, and we have the feeling that we were being used to, you know, to launder someone's reputation. Uh, but anyway, it was an opportunity for us to put something in, in a place, address an audience that we don't usually address. So we decided uh, to do it only if we could critique both the museum or the um, gallery that it was in in Paris and music videos. So we took one of our uh, well-known posters, Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into the Met Museum? And we just crossed out Met Museum and said, Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into Music Videos? Um, And then the punchline was, you know, when 99% of the guys are fully dressed. And then we took a uh, still from uh, from Blurred Lines of the you know one of the parading naked women, and we turned her into our odalesque. I, lo- I love that. When we'll we'll f- look at that when we go to uh, the web page. I asked everybody to go to gorillagirls dot com, and click on the the link there for posters and actions. If we go to there, we can look at that. Two thousand fourteen. Yes. It's, mm-hmm. it's that nice bright yellow poster. Do women have to be naked to get into music videos? And it seems like. The answer is yes. <laughs> well, not that MTV has videos anymore, but back in the day when their music videos were being played, I mean, you can go on the Internet now and watch them on YouTube, but pretty much women are featured as object of a sexual... Yeah, well, J-Lo did a pretty interesting sort of reversal of that, didn't she, just at the time we did our Pharrell poster? Really? What'd she do? Oh, um, she had guys. You know, she had beefy uh, guys. Uh, oh. Um, jumping around naked in her in her film, <laughs> I mean in her video. That's one way it's to change funny. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any stories about how Trump has funded any art exhibits or? Influenced? You know, I don't know. I don't. I don't think he really has. Um, his hair is an artwork. I think. Um, 
<laughs> I mean, I think I, I, it, you know, it's magical. It's totally magical. Uh, mm. I, you know, I really don't have any Trump stories, except that we did um, mention him on one of our uh, posters, which we updated. We did a poster uh, uh, in Montreal, I believe, in two thousand. Uh, nine or ten, um, and it was about the uh, Polytechnic Massacre, and it was a graffiti wall of sexist hate speech from throughout the ages, uh, you know, with quotes from, like, Confucius saying that, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, a hundred women are not worth a single testicle. Um, mm. It's pretty funny. I saw that uh, and then we also yeah. added, we had a quote from uh, Frank Sinatra that... Um, you know, well-rounded woman is someone who has, you know, huge breasts. Mm. Um, and then we put in Donald Trump's, you know, <clears throat> comments about women being fat slobs, pigs, and, you know, he has no time for political correctness. Is it awkward when you come to a museum to showcase your work? No. Um, no, no. I mean, we always um, think very carefully about every, um, you know, opportunity we have. Um you know, it's odd that, you know, we spend our whole lives, and we do spend our whole lives attacking the art system and art institutions. All of a sudden, they're asking us to come in and critique them. And um, one one could say, oh, you can't do that, you're being co-opted. But on the other hand, um, it goes to show that there are well-intentioned people inside, you know, institutions trying to change them, and why can't we help them out? Uh, and museums have a different, you know, have a huge audience. So we've decided that um, as long as our principles aren't um, in any way compromised and we're not censored in any way, yes, we will um, participate in museum projects. So it's fun. It's actually fun to go inside a museum and criticize the museum, right, on yeah. its own walls. But I think there, there's a way to look at it. We didn't always have that opportunity. Right. I think on the positive side, I think it's an example of how people can come together and discuss their differences, too. Gorilla yeah. girls can say, you know, hey, this is not fair. Museums might be thinking, you know, we're just going with the status quo and we're not sure how to change it. So you can work together, find ways to benefit both sides. Benef yeah. Benefit well, we everyone. Just, yeah, we just finished a, uh, a series of projects in Minneapolis um, at uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Art and also the Walker. Um, at the Walker, we did an installation of our... Um, portfolio, which they also own, like the Benton, uh, and at the Minneapolis Institute of the Arts, which is a more historic museum, kind of like the Met, um, we actually examined their collection and uh, found out all kinds of interesting things, like out of 90,000 artworks, they only have 49 works by African Americans and only 11 of them on display. Wow. Um, they have the largest Hmong and... Um, Somali population in the United States, but they have very few works by either of those groups. Um, and we made an animation, and the animation played on a loop inside the museum for over a month. Hmm. And we still have that. You can see it um, on our website somewhere. Uh, I believe it's in the beginning. Um, and, and that was really interesting that they invited us to do that. Uh, I'm not sure that they were thrilled with what we came up with, but, um, you know, they did show it, and we have it as a record, and it actually provoked them to bring some work out of storage and put it up. They put up a, um, a um, pallet that they owned by Rosa Bonheur, who was a 19th century um, French painter who presented as masculine in the, in the 19th century um, in her painting life. Um, That's really cool. And they also brought up some Somali works that uh, they hadn't had on display before, so you know, we were changing the statistics up to the last minute, which was kind of uh, frantic and hectic, but we were really happy to provoke change. Those are positive results. That's great. What can what can we do to help uh, as the uh, patrons who go into museums, or maybe we don't go to museums, and how can we get involved and help? Well, first of all, art happens in places other than museums as well, and there are lots of um, artists now who are participating in social activism, who are using their art skills for that. Um, every time I go to a demonstration, I'm just uh, amazed to see all of the signs and all of the costumes and all of the displays that, you know, that happen um, and that people design to participate in, in actions with. So that's one thing for sure. Um, you can also count when you go to art museums or places that show art, count 
You know, see if you can identify the women artists. See if you can identify the artists of color. Um, see if it looks like um, what it says it represents. And if it doesn't, complain. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, art is not a meritocracy. The art system isn't a meritocracy. And um, dialogue, discussion, discourse, um, you know, disputatiousness is all part of it. That's really great advice. I want to go quickly to the website. Everybody's got it pulled up, gorillagirls.com, and then click on posters and actions. Let me see. Right at the top, we already looked at the uh, the poster that was modified um, of an earlier version where you emphasized that women are mainly featured naked when they're in the museum, um, which is also in 2011 and 13. You, I, I believe you updated the statistics in that one, right? Yeah, we did it. We did that first, I believe, in 1989. We went to the uh, to the Met Museum on a Sunday morning, and we wanted to just count the number of uh, naked bodies in the artworks and the number of women artists in the modern collection, and just to see what it would tell us. And and we discovered that, like five, you know, what was it? Four um, percent of the artists were, you know, were women, or five percent of the artists were women, but 85 percent of the nudes were female. We we have gone back every couple of years to do another count, uh, and our latest count showed that there were actually fewer women artists but more naked males. So um, I guess that's what we have to consider progress. 1992-93, there's a great poster about uh, hormone imbalance and melanin deficiency, pointing out... Yeah, that that was uh, the New York Times did a feature article on their Sunday magazine about um, contemporary art in New York, and they featured, um, you know, Pace Gallery. And they had a photograph of all the artists in the gallery on the front page, you know, on the front cover of the magazine. It, and it was stunning when it came out. It was like, what? What's wrong with this picture? They were all white males. Um, so we decided that we would put up a, um, um, a poster very quickly. That was one of the fast posters we ever did, uh, giving it, we, we thought the situation was sick, you know, ill, and it, it, you know, had a disease, and we were, um, we wanted a doctor's diagnosis, and it was, you know, hormone imbalance and melanin deficiency. That's a great one. You guys are really creative, <laughs> and you, you make a great point. Well, we discovered, you know, we discovered that humor uh, helps you fly under the radar. You know, yes. if you can get someone who doesn't agree with you to laugh at something, you got a hook inside their brain, and while you're in there, you just might be able to change their mind. And that, that was the whole success behind Stephen Colbert, I think, when he was on The Daily Show and then branched off into his own thing. He's, he brought up topics, but he, he did it with humor to lessen the uh, the impact and make it yeah. easier. Yeah, easy he played the fool, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. So you're going to be at the Benton Museum coming up, I believe, right? Yes, this Wednesday. Yes. Yep, yep. We're really looking forward to it. Um, we're anxious to see what the show looks like. Um, and I think it might be a really wonderful day for the UConn uh, basketball team, no? Oh, are they playing? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Um, I don't watch, but that's great. The the women are playing yeah. that day. Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's a big game, too. Oh, is that the, the championship? Um, you know, I'm not sure because I'm only a an occasional follower of uh, basketball, but I love women's basketball. Yep. Um, you know, your 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 viewers might be more accurate about that than I am. Oh, wow. or your listeners. I'll have to look it up as soon as we get done. So, what what exactly can people expect if they come to the museum on the sixth on Wednesday at five o'clock? Well, we're going to be in full jungle drag. Cool. Um, there'll be two of us: myself and Zubeda Aha. Uh, my colleague, <clears throat> and we will be playing music. We've got a great, you know, playlist of girl songs. Um, and then we'll come out and sort of give a a survey of our the greatest hits of our work. We'll talk about it. Um, we'll have anecdotes about some of our posters. We'll talk about why we started. We'll um, we'll play some videos. We'll um, we'll do some readings from a couple of our unpublished books. Um, and then we'll deliver a rant and oh. have, um, we'll entertain questions from the audience. We'll talk a, a lot about how, how our protest has changed and how we've incorporated um, all kinds of other issues, intersectionality, 
um, you know, the demonization of feminism, the stereotyping of women, uh, transphobia. Um, we'll talk about how, um, you know, how feminism has really revolutionized and changed the world, even though a lot of people don't want to call themselves feminists, even though they agree with all that progress. Um, we will encourage them to reconsider that label. Um, and we'll have a good time. Hopefully everyone will go away angry and happy. <laughs> That'll be interesting. I know that sounds, yeah, that sounds like it's um, a contradiction, but angry but, and happy is okay. Yeah, and you go away angry and you say, you know what, I'm going to do something about this. Yeah, yeah. That's excellent. Frida, thank you so much for calling, and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday at the Benton Museum. Five oh, great. Time. Come up and introduce yourself. Absolutely. So yeah. may maybe I'll wear a mask, too. Oh, great. <laughs> then we won't know who each other is. Yeah, and I'll put a Marky Ramon mask on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Frida, can you hold on the line for me? Yeah, sure. All right, Frida Kahlo of the Gorilla Girls, and... Uh, it's really awesome, and uh, I was up at the Benton already and looking at all the posters on the wall, and it's cool. It's a very social engagement. Uh, you go with some friends, or you just stand next to a poster, and you stare at it, and eventually some up, someone comes up and says, Hi, how are you doing? What do you think of this? And you start talking and socializing. It's a wonderful thing to go to the museum, the Benton Museum at the University of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. 